105.6, another cup of coffee with me, Isabel. And joining me on the line, Dr. Chris Fenter. How are you doing this morning? I'm well, and you? I have no complaints. But this month, June, is a very important month. Infertility, empower yourself, have the conversation. And June is World Infertility Awareness Month. And a great time to talk to your doctor and partner about your fertility and health. So... Let's get to the bottom line. What is infertility? Well, basically, it's just when a couple uh, has been uh, having intercourse for about a year and was not able to conceive within that year. So the prevalence or incidence of that is about 50% of our couples. So we would usually advise a couple, if you've been having regular intercourse, and we talk about regular intercourse about twice a week, and within a year's time, if you have not conceived, then um, you should seek medical advice because then you would fall within a 50% of the population who has not conceived. Um, so I think that is a good time to then to seek medical attention and just to hear about what is the reason for why you have not conceived. So what's the prevalence of infertility? How many people does this actually affect? Well, so in our population, it's 15%, um, and I do get the question a lot from our patients as well. It feels like there is more couples suffering from infertility, uh, but uh, prevalence has been remaining 15% for the last uh, couple of decades as well, um, and that's what we've been seeing. As well. I, I sometimes, when I do see couples as well, they will ask us, but doctor, maybe we've just been unlucky. So I, I usually tell them that... If you've been having intercourse for one year, you've got about an 85% chance to be pregnant within, within that year. After two years of trying, you should have about a 90% chance, and after three years, 95%. So, so again, over time, if things do not happen, then you should seek attention just to make sure what, what is the reason for you not conceiving. So. Okay, so obviously there would be tests that would have to take place to ascertain whether the issue would be with either, well, with which partner or both of them. Uh, what kind of tests are we looking at to determine whether infertility is an issue? So I'm happy when you say both partners, because sometimes we just get the females that present to us as well, and they just say, but doctor, I cannot conceive and we should start doing testing, and then you do ask him what has your husband or partner been tested. Um, and I say, should say, I said, well, never. So, so again, it is a, it takes two to tango, and it is very important that if the female starts with the investigations, that the male would also do his investigations right from the start, so that we don't just focus on one party and then forget about the other party. But if we look at males, so usually we would start with by just doing a sperm functionality test or sperm count. Um, and in the sperm count as well, we would be able to see, first of all, what is the volume that's been produced, what is the concentration, very important, how many sperm is there per ejaculate. And then thirdly as well, what does the sperm look like as well? Because sometimes we see if there's a lot of stress in the, the, the male, then the, the sperm also starts looking abnormal, and we know that sperm does not exist very easily. Um, so, so that's where we started in the males. In the females as well, it's just very important that we would just start with the basic test. And this includes an ultrasound to make sure she's got a good normal uterus. And you can see that on the ultrasound. The second thing is then to look at her ovaries. And when you look at ovaries as well, you can see what is that female's egg count. And that, that is very important. You get your chronological age, but you also get your fertility age as well. And on that scan, you can look at someone's egg count. And then thirdly as well, then what you would want to establish is that you've got open fallopian tubes. So usually we would just do an x-ray for that. Um, and then fourthly, it's just other basic to get a thyroid gland um, to, and to also do a test to make sure these females are ovulating. So okay. Again, what we usually say for a female is that if she's got a regular cycle, if she's got not excessive pain during the cycle, um, then she has very high likelihood that she's ovulating and that um, we could just then focus on the timing as well. So I mean, these are the basic tests, and then usually with a good thorough investigation, clinical examination, we can start excluding things like endometriosis that can also play a role in, in, um, in subsequently. So, so what would be some of those causes of infertility? 
So usually if you just look at males and females as well, I think females, unfortunately 50% of uh, when we would get a course, it is female-related. In males, about 30% of them, it would be due to them. Um, and then 20%, we would then say it's unexplained. Uh, but I think what's very important to this as well, that in 80% of the cases of couples that we do see, we can identify, of course, why they, this couple has been trying to um, conceive. Um, in 20% of the cases, yes, we cannot find an answer, but then there's also ways that we, how we deal with these, these cases as well. But if we just look at um, males as well, um, just with someone with a low sperm count, has there been previous injuries, previous medication, or is it just purely related to uh, work stress or smoking or being uh, overweight? And then in females, I think this is where we can sort of try and identify more issues and deal with them as well. So... In 40% of the patients, female patients, the causes are when they are not ovulating, either due to polycystic ovaries or is the most thyroid issue. Um, and these are the very easy cases that we deal with as well, to say, well, let's start you on ovulation induction tablets to help you to ovulate. In another 40% of patients, it might be due to blocked tubes or it might be something like endometriosis, which we see in about 20% of our cases as well, that we know that endometriosis can lower your chance and that after treatment, um, that either um, 50% of the patients will conceive spontaneously as well. So I think it is very important when you do see a couple is to make a diagnosis and um, just to make sure that the couple understands the reason. I think it's very fair in an era where people are well informed and there's a lot of uh, information out there as well to, to, to empower your patient to say, well, this is the cause. It's not something you've been doing wrong. This is the real cause of your not conceiving, and then to deal with those issues as well. Um, one thing that I do think a couple find very frustrating is when they are just being given tablets to say, well, that's try these tablets for six months or a year, and then if you're not pregnant, come and see me after that year. And, uh, I always think it's like if someone has a headache and you just keep on giving them headache tablets, you might not find an uh, underlying cause for for the headache as well. I think the similar goes for infertility as well. So empower your patients with a diagnosis and then treat them systematically according to that as well. Absolutely. So in COVID-19, with this whole pandemic, do you think that the COVID-19 pandemic has affected fertility? Yeah, I think what what, what we saw initially was a... Um, so, so we got that quite a lot. Is that patients that... Um, Females especially, when they did, um, got COVID, there was an irregularity with their cycle, so they, they had some months where they did not menstruate, so, so we, we, we were able to pick that up. Um, but one thing we have not seen was that it, it did affect the egg reserve, or it, in the long run, it does not have any long-term sort of consequences of ability. In males as well, where males were very ill during the COVID, um, we did see that in a few of our patients' sperm analysis as well, that it did take at least three months for that sperm count to get back to where it used to be before the, the COVID uh, infection as well. So, so I think the effects of COVID on fertility, now it is um, it's temporary. I don't think it's permanent, um, but we did see some change in it as well. Um, but I think for, for a longer reason, it, patients should not be concerned that if they do that COVID, it will if you have been diagnosed with fertility issues or infertility, is there a treatment or what treatment options do we have? Like I say, it's just, just get you a diagnosis. Patients understand, but this is the reason. Because I think uh, patients do treat this diagnosis of infertility very privately. They don't want to discuss it well. And so when we start looking at what can be the reason, so like in endometriosis, if you've been trying to conceive like excessively painful periods, then most likely the endometriosis is playing part in your infertility as well. So, so usually in younger patients, we would say, well, you need a laparoscopy to go fix that endometriosis and then be expectant for a year thereafter. And what we've been seeing in a lot of our younger patients is that um, soon after the surgeries within the next three or six months, they will conceive significantly. So that's what endometriosis. If someone struggles with um, 
the fallopian tubes that's been blocked due to infection or previous surgery or endometriosis, then sometimes those patients, um, depending on the damage of these tubes, can these tubes be uh, rectified and opened? And if not, then not to struggle and go for repeated surgeries as well. Just rather to say, well, this is the issue, I need to be to address this issue as well. And like I said as well, for some of our females suffering from an ovulation where they do not ovulate, and again, this is, this is medical treatment, so we would give them medication. And again, when you do give medication, you need to make sure that this medication is working. It's not like giving it and say, well, you don't trust yourself. You need to monitor the effect that the medication have on her ovulation. And so I think it is also, it's not justifiable. You give someone a tablet and just say, well, Whatever it takes, that you need to make sure that this medication is working for us. You know, every, every individual has its own sort of, I always say, formula that gets us going. So you need to identify which formula will help that patient to ovulate. <laughs> when we look at a male issue, um, I think it is important, and, and, and we see this quite a lot as well, that the male comes. Um, and you can see that in the sperm count, especially the, the way the sperm is formed, uh, the morphology, the way the sperm is looking, it can get uh, abnormal cells. This is all stress-related. So, again, to say, well, you need to start looking at your health. Your, your sperm now is just showing that there is stress on your system. And there we would say, well, reduce, well, stop smoking. This is ideal. Look at your weight because we do know weight lowers your sperm count. It makes your sperm lazier and like, gives you abnormal sperm. Um, and, and start looking at your lifestyle as well. Um, looking at work-related stress, there's not much we can do about it as well, but maybe just to take some antioxidants and to try and improve the, um, uh, the effect that stress has on your, your sperm count as well. But I think there's lots of things that you can do yourself try and improve our own fertility. Um, but yeah, we, we, try, and we try and identify the reasons and then treating that um, as according to what the issue is. When we look at the women with unexplained, and I think one thing, I, if I get the opportunity as well, I would do it to what we would see at our fertility clinic as well, is that <coughs> patients do take there is a delay in time where patients is treating timelessly as well. That I think every female, if she's uh, about 32 years of age, she seeks fertility treatment. She needs to know what is her egg count, what is her fertility count. So I think um, we see a lot of females that present to us as well, and they've been treated for years and years with either medication or just the, uh, giving reassurance. And then when we do see them, we say, well, there is a, they've got a lower egg count. And there might be various reasons for this as well, but once your egg count starts to fall at a certain point, it can take longer to produce that golden egg. I do think as far as the general work of our patients, when they do present for medical assessment, is that they need to ask the doctor to do the test that test their fertility count um, and the egg count. And this test is called your anti-malarian hormone or, or your AMH test. I think that's a very important uh, point to note. So, Dr. Uh, Dr. Finter, um, when you think you have possibly got some issues with your fertility, where would be the best place to go to, as you say, get the tests done? Who do we talk to and well, who's the right doctor to go and see? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a very important point. I know my father was was a general practitioner as well, and he was very good at doing certain things, which I'm for surely not. So, but I do think if you present to someone, your doctor, and most doctors and have a very good relationship with their patient, say, the patient, I think it's very fair to ask uh, from your doctor, is doctor, do you feel comfortable in treating my fertility issue? And if not, you rather to say, well, it is a speciality area, I'd rather to refer you to someone who, who um, specializes in infertility care as well. Um, and then again, it's just there's so many things that can be done just by uh, the first assessment. Just to make a diagnosis, that's the first thing we want to know. Because it empowers your patient to say, well, now I've identified the issue and now I'm going to deal with it. So, so 
So in South Africa, there is 20 facility units throughout the country, um, and so usually, and it's all combined under um, uh, SASREC, which is the society that sort of uh, promotes these clinics as well. But I think um, it is a subspeciality, and I do think it is justified to, to seek specialist help as well. And it's also very important that if you've been trying for eight months or so, it, it's okay. It's just, but you just ask your general practitioner or your um, gynecologist. But if this problem has been for two or three years or longer, then I think that, that requires specialist help as well. So, so in these specialist units, it's all that we are focusing on is fertility. So we don't do obstetrics, we don't do um, other stuff that other specialities can do much better than we can. So we are purely focused on fertility care. Dr. Fenter, thank you so much for your time, for the information, and good luck with uh, the rest of the month, with World Infertility Month, and raising awareness. And yet again, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity, and uh, yeah, uh, yeah. have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Fenter, you can, of course, uh, find out more about infertility.